In June of 1940, France has suffered the greatest defeat of her history. Her military overthrow has been followed by an unacceptable armistice. Most of her territory is now occupied. France is not only crushed, she is humiliated. General de Gaulle is in London, along with the handful of volunteers who have rallied to his appeal. He does not accept the defeat, and he finds the armistice intolerable. He wants to see the combat continue and to be a figurehead for the France that still wants to fight. To that end, he has to know what's happening on French territory. What he needs is his very own independent and dedicated intelligence service with its own agents, weapons, and communications. What he lacks, though, is professionals. The pre-war intelligence services have remained part of the Armistice Army faithful to Pétain. They have not come to join de Gaulle in London. The general is on his own. Le général de Gaulle avait besoin d'un service de renseignement. Il a essayé d'organiser quelque chose, de bricoler quelque chose, il faut bien le dire, car parmi ceux qu'il avait rejoints, il n'y avait pas beaucoup de spécialistes des services secrets. On the 30th of June 1940, eight days after Pétain has signed the armistice, de Gaulle starts meeting with the young André de Wavrin, alias Colonel Passy a 29-year-old graduate professor of fortifications at Saint-Cyr Military Academy. The general asks him to set up an intelligence service, an indispensable means of staying informed about what's happening back in France and hitting back at the enemy. Mon patron, c'était le colonel Passy. J'ai fait sa connaissance, je l'ai trouvé très rigoureux, un peu renfermé. On savait que... Il menait une vie assez austère. On avait de l'admiration pour lui et on constatait naturellement qu'il menait une action pour laquelle il n'avait jamais été formé. After some preliminary research, Passy makes some requests of de Gaulle. Mon général, I do not really know, but I have been thinking about what I will need. I would like to have men, money and signaling capabilities, since these will all be essential if we're to establish contact with France. De Gaulle replies, I have no money and I have no means of signaling. As for men, well, you just have to walk around London. There are plenty of Frenchmen here for you to recruit. For the young Passy, the mission is both complex and untested. He has to find ways of spying on his own country, where there are many people ready to provide information, if only they could be asked to. But Passy is an innovator. He not only trains up agents, he even sets up undercover intelligence networks under the general's command that will keep on functioning right up until the liberation. Help comes to Passy in the form of a very important meeting. Gilbert Renault is also known as Morin, alias Jean-Luc, alias Watteau, alias Roulier, alias Recordier, and above all, alias Colonel Rémy, the pseudonym he will use all his life. He's a film producer, right wing, and a fervent Catholic. He offers his services to Colonel Passy. He's unruly, but first rate. Colonel Rémy's cover will simply be that of a film producer. Passy a gratté ce qu'il a pu dans les tiroirs de la francine, on m'a donné 20 000 francs, 20 000 francs de l'époque. Je veux bien, mais enfin c'était tout. Et puis je suis parti. J'avais une adresse à Lisbonne, je suis allé trouver le chef de la cinématographie portugaise en lui disant que je devais faire un film sur Colomb, mais que Magellan, ce qui est vrai du reste, avait beaucoup plus de mérite que Christophe Colomb, que la fierté portugaise s'accommoderait mal de ne pas avoir mis Magellan à l'honneur. J'ai reçu très bon accueil. Et Magellan a servi par la suite à une foule de gens qui n'avaient aucunement l'intention de tourner ce film qui pourrait être très beau du reste. C'était un homme entreprenant, affable, beau parleur, euh, 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 ajoutant quelquefois un petit peu à la vérité, euh, truculent même, euh, mais chaleureux et entraînant. 
Remy's first mission is to install a surveillance network of the Atlantic coast, from Brest down to Spain, and to recruit suitably placed agents, harbor pilots, railwaymen, postmen. Remy, a committed Catholic, names his organization the Brotherhood of Our Lady. It will carry out many operations. On the 27th of February, 1942, thanks to intelligence from Remy, a joint operation is organized with the British to parachute commandos into Bruneval, north of Le Havre. Their objective, to dismantle a German radar post that has been spotting English bombers and to take it back to England. Operation Biting is a success. The commandos bring two German prisoners back with them too, one of them a radar operator. None of this would have been possible without Remy's information. The head of the British Secret Service will later say he considered Remy to be the most extraordinary secret agent he has ever known. The undercover war gives rise to some rather unusual equipment. Elegant silk scarves with maps of France or codes printed on them. Maps printed on rice paper that will burn up in an instant. Rings containing cyanide pills for committing suicide if you're captured. And even a discreet pocket pen stroke gun. Between 1942 and 1944, a series of resistance and intelligence networks springs up in France, each one covering a part of the country. Many of them are set up by Passy's men. These networks bring together men, both Gaullists and Socialists, who will later have important roles to play. Jacques Focard, alias Binot, who will become de Gaulle's indispensable man in the shadows. Gaston Defer, alias Denver, who joins the network known as Brutus. Charles Pasqua, alias Prairie. And even a certain Morlan, real name François Mitterrand who, after a spell with the Vichy government, signs up with the Gaullist networks. In January of 1942, in the greatest secrecy, Colonel Passy's team moves into number 10 Duke Street, near Hyde Park. From now on, Free France's own intelligence service will be known as the BCRA, the Bureau Central de Renseignement et d'Action. And Free France now also has a women's corps. The young Teresca Torres joins the team. La population locale ne savait pas que nous travaillions au BCRA. On ne se promenait pas avec une étiquette. Je suis dans les services secrets de la France libre. Nous appelions ça la maison chut chut. Je me souviens d'un bureau pas très grand et que nous recevions du courrier qui venait de France, que nous classions. Je me souviens de grandes cartes avec des endroits probablement euh, qui avaient été demandés par les résistances pour qu'on parachute du matériel ou des gens. Et je rencontrais le général de Gaulle souvent. Et à ce moment-là, je me mettais au garde-à-vous et je le regardais comme si je regardais Jeanne d'Arc. <rire> 